and I'll turn it over to speaker view as well. All right. Hmm. I don't know how to do this. Share to a page. There we go. I'm learning new things. This is wonderful. It's professional development day. Yes, it is. I'm also professionally developing. All right, we're live and ready to go. We're live and ready to go. Okay, well, wonderful. Hopefully we'll have some people join us as we get going too. Um, thank you everyone for joining us, wherever you are joining us from. Um, hopefully we'll get a few people in our room, but also we're, we're live on Facebook, which is really exciting for us too. Um, my name is Laura. I'm the School and Public Programs Manager at the Maritime Museum of BC, and I'm here with all of my wonderful colleagues who are going to be um, introducing themselves as well shortly. Um, to get started, I am going to share this guy real quick. Um, so yes, we're very excited to have you all here to talk about um, different ways of making in the age of COVID in the digital age. And um, these are all of my colleagues who are joining us today. At the end of the ProD, I will be sharing this slide again if anyone has questions. So um, please do feel free to contact any of us. Um, this is, I'm also learning how to use this. I'm going to stop sharing for now. And we would also like to acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen speaking peoples on whose unceded territory that we are working, working and learning today. The Songhees and Esquimalt and Wasanich peoples have been stewards and caretakers of this land for millennia. And we thank them for the privilege of this opportunity to gather virtually on their territory today. Um, we'd also like you to take a moment and reflect on and acknowledge the territory that you're located on as you join us as well. And do feel free to put that in the chat, to put that in the Facebook comments, where you're joining from us, whose territory you're on, and uh, share that information with us. So to get going, um, all of us panelists, we wanted to um, share a little bit about creativity for ourselves and in our own institutions. And so I'll let all of the other panelists do their own introductions and talk about creativity themselves at that time. But to get us started, um, I have a few things to talk about in terms of creativity for myself, um, Laura, and then also with me today, I have Anya, who is our public engagement intern at the museum. And for us, creativity is getting to do things differently, um, refusing to let current structures define the way that we run things. It means that we get to play around with new ideas, um, collaborate on exciting things, and work around issues that might arise. It's probably one of my favorite parts of the work I do um, because I'm a creative person. In my personal life, it's actually a way of nurturing my mental health. And so it helps that my career involves this too. And our making activity today, I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so to describe my creative process in just one sentence, um, it usually starts with a challenge that needs a solution and usually a challenge that needs a solution of a different way of thinking. Um, then I brainstorm that independently or with others to figure out the best way to approach it. The most creative thing I think that the Maritime Museum of BC has done throughout the last six months is that we've gotten pretty much everything available virtually. Um, plus more, actually. We went through every aspect of our operations and put as much of it as we could online. Um, for those who are willing, we can do almost all of our previous programming virtually. We have kits you can purchase with materials and instructions for workshops. We've done virtual programs for children and seniors, and we are constantly showing items from the collection and from around downtown Victoria. We're even in the midst of designing a member portal with access to all of our digital content, previous talks, tours, exhibits, and programs. Um, because I'm at a museum, because we're at a museum, we often start with our collection to get our creative juices flowing. So our collection and archives is our first place to look. And um, we need to check if we have the materials to help us do what we want to do. And if we don't, then we need to look for human resources. So people that can help us get things done. 
our colleagues, especially those at the museum, but also reaching out to people at other community groups and institutions as well. And the internet has been a vast and magical place that we can find so many different ideas. Um, our members and community have also been a great source of suggestions to us. Anytime we make call outs to them asking for ideas, they're always in and ready to help. Um, I'm now going to pass things on to, I believe it is Devin, who is joining us from the Bank of Victoria Public Library. So passing it on to you, Devin. Hi, I'm Devin. I'm a public services librarian with the Greater Victoria Public Library, and I'm here today with my portfolio partner, Caitlin. just let my face show up. <laughs> um, so I'm Caitlin. Um, I am also a public services librarian with Greater Victoria Public Library. Um, and when Devin and I um, were talking about uh, sort of coming and joining our friends today, um, we talked a lot about um, sort of what creativity looks like to us and, and what that means um, in our um, sort of environment as public librarians. Um, but it also is um, very much relevant to educators and, and teachers. We think there's a lot of overlap um, between the cool things that we do and the cool things that you might do. Um, so ultimately, um, most of our conversation centered around the fact that creativity is so hard. It's really hard. Um, it's always hard and it's extra hard right now. Um, we're all so tired, we know that, and um, we're tired of Zoom calls, but we're really happy to be here with our friends today um, because that is the number one thing um, for both of us that we get our creativity from is just chatting with each other, chatting with our other colleagues, and chatting with our wonderful community partners. Um, and I think that's something we've been pretty proud of in the last little while with um, our organization, with the library, is the ways that we are trying to find new and creative ways to engage with our community partners out in the world. Um, because the fact of the matter is that being creative in a vacuum is just about impossible. And so um, we rely really heavily on um, resources. I'm just gonna throw, um, I have a list of things that I use, um, I just threw in the chat. Um, so different blogs, um, different Facebook groups um, that I just follow and then that way I can sort of passively take in some of those ideas and they all come together in my brain eventually. Um, I think it's fair to say for both Devin and I and for a lot of our librarian colleagues, um, our creative process looks like do research, talk to friends, do more research, talk to more friends, walk away and come back two days later and there's something really great waiting for you. Um, so just making sure that you're being kind to yourself, um, it's, you know, it's so hard to be even doing 10% of our jobs right now for everyone and we're all doing way more than 10% of our jobs. And so I'm making sure that you are being okay with the fact that things are going to be a bit weird. Um, but knowing that there are people to talk to. Um, I can't speak for all librarians in the world, but I know that I'm very excited to talk to any teachers who would like to chat and we can definitely um, sort of think about ways that we can work together and we can be resources for that was most of our conversation. I think, Devin, did you have any specifics you wanted to add? <laughs> um, no, I think you covered it. <laughs> so I think that means Chris. Yeah, so I think I'm, I'm next. So hello, everyone. Um, welcome for join, joining in either in the Zoom room or um, on Facebook Live. My name is Chris O'Connor. Um, I work, I'm a learning program developer here at the Royal BC Museum and, um, and I feel really lucky to, to work here and it's, um, but one of the things about a museum and the way that I, I think about creativity is one of the things about the museum is that it's a challenging place. It's, museums are colonial institutions, they are sometimes incredibly rigid and um, people even have the perception that museums are like dusty and stuck. And what I and my colleagues in, in learning here at the museum and, and the way we like to connect with educators and learners across the province is really like think of museums as creative and malleable spaces. And that kid voice is a really important aspect of the museum. So um, one thing that we, we often try to do is have 
classes come in and show their work within the museum to really shake up the, the perceived staticness of the space. Um, and working with community is also incredibly important for us here in terms of creative process. So rather than have all the ideas that we, we do here at the museum be within the museum, that we're really co-creating um, with community uh, is, is a shift that's happening with the museums and it's a shift that uh, we've been doing and learning for, for many years now. And it's been led by our work with incredible educators, both in the Victoria, greater Victoria area, but further um, as well. So um, a little bit of what I'll do in my session today is around uh, creativity and specifically around dioramas and using dioramas as a tool within a classroom. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for your work. This year is, and the end of last year is incredibly challenging to everyone and the an educator uh, has also meant parents and other grown-ups and other um, other people this year. So, like, I really, really value the the work that's been happening over this past uh, pandemic time. So, thank you. Um, and then we'll we'll end uh, with Rebecca. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Tanchi, hello. My name is Rebecca Haas. I'm Anishinaabe, Métis, and Mixed European. I'm originally from Treaty 20 territory, which is Williams Treaty and Treaty 61, Robinson Huron, and that's all in Ontario. I've been an uninvited guest here on Lekwungen territory for about 15 years, and I came because the land is so beautiful, and I am very grateful for the stewardship of the ancestors before. I've spent about 30 years of my life or more as a performer, and I now find myself three years into my role as the Director of Community Engagement for Pacific Opera. So in that role, I get to deliver programming to schools. Some people will be uh, beneficiaries of our Living Opera program, where we send teaching artists in and chat with the students, sometimes about the opera, because we have a student dress rehearsal program we run in non-pandemic times. Uh, and sometimes now we've been really reaching out into the greater impact of all of the people that make an opera come to fruition. And I think that's the focus of my education work right now, is to remove barriers for people. Um, I know Chris talked about the dustiness of how people feel about museums. And of course, opera is traditionally an extremely Eurocentric art form, uh, really popular in 1700 and 1800. And it's a growing art form and it needs to be a contemporary art form. And I think we wanna see all kinds of people enjoying it and being part of that process that makes this art form. So we're focusing right now on a lot of backstage elements of opera. So we're not just sort of trying to talk to people about the singing portion in education, but we have props, we have costumes, we have sets. So we have places for artists and craftsmen. We have carpentry. Uh, there's all kinds of elements that go into making theatrical projects happen. And that's been a fun thing to explore as part of our education work. This year, Living Opera will be an online thing. We're going to script it and record it as six videos, and we'll be making that available to schools, really, I guess, anywhere now. That's the gift of the virtual world, because you don't really need us in the classroom. So I look forward to sharing that with everyone. Um, creativity, such an interesting conversation and a great topic, certainly one that I think about all the time. I mentor and teach a lot of singers still uh, in my outside time. Um, I think what I always want people to think about is that we're all naturally creative. I think it's odd that we feel that to be an artist is to get a passport stamped and someone will tell you you're an artist and then you can walk through life and know you're creative. But we're all creative all the time. When we get dressed in the morning, it's a creative act. Choosing my lipstick this morning was a creative act. Conversation is a creative act, the route I walk to work. So it's not just when we pick up a pen and draw something. It's not just when we have a paintbrush in our hands or when we sing. It's all the time and it's everywhere. And so that's something I really like to explore with people is just recognizing all the ways you're manifesting creatively and not withholding yourself from identifying that you are creative all the time. I'm going to be um, also kind of and play a little fun outside game, which is if I have to describe my creative process in one sentence, um, I'm a big fan of being bored. I think some of my very best ideas come when I'm bored. I certainly recognize that to be creative, there's a discipline attached to it. And I will be inspired by art galleries and books that I read or things that I see. 
But the real key element for me is just empty time. I just don't think we hang out anymore. There are too many distractions. There's too many things I can sort of fiddle around with. And I really try to cultivate empty space in my life. And whether that's a walk in the forest, because I can do that here, or it's just sitting around, right, and looking at a wall, it's not wasted time creatively. I think that that space makes all kinds of things arise and are extremely beneficial. So having said that, I am the first person who gets to present. And so um, I'm going to leap off on this idea that I'm talking about, which is confidence. I thought it would be really wonderful as a singer to talk about confidence. It's something that seems to be elemental in the work that we do. And I think to be creative, we often need to feel confident because we all have an inner voice that says that we're not good enough. We don't know what we're doing. Other people probably don't like what we're doing. It's not just true for the people we work with, the young people, but it's also true as adults. We all have that nagging voice. And I think there are tools in an opera singer's kit that can help us quiet that voice and really release what is creative inside of us. So I wanna start by getting us to do something physical. And we'll see if I figured this out correctly with my backdrop. I want everyone to stand up wherever you are. It's always nice if you can stand up. See if I can keep myself in frame. Super fun. All right. So I want to talk about breath. So people think that singers are loud because somehow we have something different inside our throats, and we don't. We all have the same kind of little tiny dime-sized muscle. What one of the key things is for us is breath. And breath is something that also gives us confidence because it helps us settle in our body. We spend a lot of time running around in our head. So I want to teach you about singers breathing because I think that's something you can share with students when they're being creative and they want to feel confident. So if I were to ask you to normally take a breath at this point, if you stood sort of balanced, right, athletic stance, bend your knees a little bit, and just take a breath the way you normally do and see if you can feel where it is. Is it the nose? Do you feel any movement in the belly, chest, rib cage? Just notice your own regular breath. So an opera singer is gonna take that feeling of breath and go a little further. The really counterintuitive instruction I have for you is to take your hands and place them on your belly. So the belly is the thing most of us are used to sucking in all the time and certainly I have a COVID 10 at least I've been trying to get rid of. So bellies are something we don't feel very comfortable about. But bellies are key to really feeling grounded and open for breath. So I want you to soften your belly and just let it relax. Like no one can see you, like you're in your sweatpants at home, like most of us are on Zoom and our pajama pants. And just let that be soft. This allows all of your organs to descend and makes more room for your rib cage. So now take some of your normal breaths and see if that feels different with just a soft belly. It's just so nice to be embodied. We spend very little time feeling our bodies and yet our bodies are key to everything we do in life. So it's so nice just to breathe. So now that you feel what a soft belly does, let's expand our rib cage and really start to bring in some oxygen. So if you take one of your hands and make a little fist and put it in the side here, you can probably feel your bones of your rib cage. You take the other one and put it on the other side so it looks like we have an attitude. And now I want you to breathe and I want these to move out. So it's like you're a balloon filling up. And try and let this be calm and just have the rib cage expand. So take a deeper inhalation and feel the expanse. If you feel like you really have this going, you can open one of those hands and actually feel around the back and see if you can feel the breath actually goes into your back as well. Take another nice deep inhalation, relax your belly and fill it up. When we think about stage fright, this is key to when we feel anxious, when we have to give Zoom presentations or when students have to give presentations. Our breath will get really high up in here. And that's a place we can't really function from, right? It just kind of activates a fear mechanism. But soft belly, big chest breathing, starts to help us feel calmer and like we're actually here. Now, 
I've shown you a big breath, but if I were traditionally going to ask you, and feel free to take one, if I said, fill up your lungs and take a big breath, what happens? We kind of all go to our chest, and you can feel all the inherent tension of what we think a big breath is. And now come back and take my singer's breath and feel the difference. feels so good, so relaxing, so in our bodies. Now, I want to do one more thing with our breath. I want you to hear the exhalation. So I want you to think about how slowly you can let all the air out. So we'll use a, a sibilant sound so you can listen to it, and then you can really feel the collapse of this, I guess, and you can feel your belly start to go in. And we can actually feel the mechanism of our breath. And then at the end, let's see how grounded we feel. So take that nice singer breath, inhale, low and deep, and exhale slowly. You can go until your lung sacs stick together. And then if you just open your mouth, air will naturally flood in and you'll get a natural deep breath without even activating the way I've asked you to. It's such a fun thing to play with how breath actually works to really stand inside your body. I want to take this now and I want to turn it into how we now make the voice make sound using all that great breath. So every exercise we're going to do, we're going to actually set it up with the breath that I just taught you. So singers are loud, not because we have something different in here, as we've said. Yes, something to do with breath, but the other piece is it's about bones. So all the bones in my body are resonators. You know, of course, that our bones are made up of some solid material, but also air pockets in between. And singers get very good at bouncing sound off of their body. Uh, maybe a good way to understand this is, why do we all sound so good in the shower? It's because of all the hard surfaces we bounce the voice off of. So in some ways, singers are like their own portable shower stall. We know how to use the bones. So let's play around with resonance. And this is fun if you're working with students in storytelling or character or imaginary games where you want to play someone different. So we're going to use some character voices. The first one and the easiest one to find is going to be one that lives up here in what we call our mask resonance. So the exercise we're going to do is we're going to make a noise like a cat. So I hope you're not somewhere public and people are going to look at you weirdly. But anyway, here it is. We're all going to go meow. You want it to be really right in your nose. Meow, meow, meow. Makes great faces. I'm so glad this is online. So we make our meow noise. Meow up in here. And then we actually find in the tip of our nose in that tiny little place that we have a voice that sounds like it's very good for Halloween. Welcome, welcome, come in. So a great fun thing to do, costs me nothing here in my throat. It's all about playing with what that resonant space is. It's also a great one if you're in a noisy room and you want to be heard. Putting it into your nose really helps people hear you because it gives it cut. So that's my tip if you're in a noisy room. Not so much with COVID, but at some point that will be useful again. But that's one of the ways we can actually use resonance to make a pointy sound and play a character. Notice as well that when we do that, when I do that, everything in me kind of already gnarls up. Just like I was kind of an old woman or a hag or a witch character. So our body is so linked into the sound we make. Character comes out of sound, which is kind of a fun way to go at it. The other sound I want to teach you to make is something kind of lovely. We'll go with something, sort of think about your prince, princess, your Walt Disney world, something welcoming. And that's going to be a sound that's going to come out of us hooting like an owl. So let's all hoot like an owl. And you can make it be a slide. So perhaps it's a lazy owl. Ooh, ooh. Notice that even already, right, I feel that as a body action. I feel like I'm on a very slow roller coaster. Ooh. If we now talk on that sound, we'll make something that's very legato. It's a musical term, but that will feel smooth and welcoming. So if I take the same phrase that my hag had, welcome to you, I can move it into 
Ooh, welcome to you. And now I am speaking on my breath in a very sing-songy way, but feel sort of like a fairy godmother and a welcoming sound. All the vowels carry the sound, all the M's and the N's carry the sound, and that's some way that we can find a character that has space and elegance and warmth of heart. So that's sort of my fairy godmother middle voice sound. And that sound you can feel actually lives probably in my cheeks a little bit, but has brought a little bit of this resonance in place as we talk about the body resonance. The last sound we're going to make is going to be really all about this part of our body. So we're going to hum now. So if you take your hand and place it on your chest and hum in your lower register, and you may need to hum to find it. So if we start high, you can always slide down. But then we're just going to see, can we feel the vibration of the sound? So I get some buzz here, but I can feel it in here. It's warm. It's like chocolate. So that's our chest sound. When we want to sound confident, when we're starting to speak to someone, if we're nervous, or we're playing a character who is serious, older, and has some gravitas, that's the voice we are looking for. You can help yourself find it in speech by imagining that your voice actually is here and your mouth is here instead of it coming out up here. So if you imagine this is where you speak from, we can take the same phrase with that nice hum. We're going to hum and we're going to say, welcome and it will be nice and slow so let's hum our way into it mm, welcome so embodied so grounded such a great source of confidence so these are some of the ways that i love to play with the body and making sound great for storytelling Great for just confidence and feeling embodied and feeling like you can do it. And for me, that's a release of creativity, is feeling like I can do it. I wanted to sing you, just before we leave, just a little phrase from a Sondheim song, which is to empower all of us to use our voices, to make friends with our voices, and feel creative and confident. And this is Anyone Can Whistle. Anyone can whistle, that's what they say, easy. Anyone can whistle any old day, easy. It's all so simple. Relax, let go, let fly. Someone tell me why can't I? So I'm telling you, you can. Relax, let go, let fly, be creative, and breathe deep. And during COVID times, it's probably the best advice I have. Thank you so much for your time. I have loved sharing this with you educators, and I hope we have a chance to share our living opera with you. And I'm gonna pass it back to Laura, our moderator. Thank you so much. Rebecca, that was so nice. I, as, as all these years of working together, I don't think I've ever heard you sing. <laughs> that was beautiful. I keep that rather secret these days. Yeah, it was lovely. Um, I was thinking, Rebecca, the, uh, the, when the beginning when you were talking about breath and being calm, I know one of our participants here is an EA and I, but also I think educators in general, I, I know a lot of educators already are using um, breath and really important ways to ground learners uh, if if they're having a hard time or just as a standard practice. Um, so that was really lovely. And then I think also the um, I, I was just thinking about how like there is almost three personalities of those voices, and it it would probably be a really interesting exercise for work with learners within a classroom to just even have that vocabulary. Are you like, can you be in your cat voice or your owl voice for this presentation or for your, um, so, and that just like to, to expand the range of what's possible. Um, and to, again, to go back to what you said in the very beginning about confidence and 
feeling uh, confident in where you are. So um, yeah, those are some thoughts. Did anyone else have any thoughts from um, either on uh, Facebook Live or, or in uh, the Zoom room? Any questions for Rebecca or, or any sort of comments from that? I just feel like your song is like washing over me, so. For me, it was just nice and calming too. Like just thinking of mindfulness and like slowing down activities. It was just like, it's nice to just remember to breathe and to do it deeply. So yeah, that was a really fun activity. Thanks, Rebecca. You're so welcome. Right, which also comes back to that idea of creativity is not just when you're on a stage, but it's every, every time, like every, every breath. It's everything everywhere. It's how you read a newspaper. You can't not be creative. It's how you take yeah. in information. Yeah. So, um, so I'm next uh, at the museum. So just everyone that's joining and we have, uh, we set this to be from 10 to 1130. Uh, if we go a little shorter, that's great, but we won't go longer than 1130. Um, and the, the four uh, organizations are doing short little workshops um, just to give a little window into how we think about creativity and how we can work together uh, with you in your schools and your classrooms and your uh, community with your community groups. Um, as I said, I'm a learning program developer. Uh, just so you know, just so I um, don't forget to say this uh, at the end, we're, we're doing digital visits here at the museum. Uh, so we do digital tours, we do digital workshops. Um, we also, and so definitely you'll see our, my contact again at the end. Uh, definitely reach out to me uh, if you're at all interested in in doing anything with us. Uh, we also, every Wednesday, we have uh, RBCM at Home Kids, which is a free online uh, session. And actually, the Pacific Opera Victoria was the special guest on Wednesday, this past Wednesday. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about today is, is dioramas. The museum, the Royal BC Museum, as I said earlier, that's a, it, museums in general are challenging can be challenging places, but they also can be really magical spaces as well. And I think one of the, one of the ways in which, because I work with schools and I work with kids all the time coming into the museum, that magical sort of look on their eye when they come in, it's because of the dioramas. It's because of the immersive nature of like coming into a space and feeling like you're, you've been transported somewhere else. And I feel like that's a, that's a, that's a useful tool uh, within the classroom as well. So I wanted to just give you a little like overview. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna pull up, I'm gonna pull up this, here we go. It's not responding, sorry about that. <laughs> Oops. Hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop share and then I'll I'll try again. And if it doesn't work this time, then that's fine. Um okay. Can you see that okay? Okay, great. So um when we're looking at the museum, the museum was the museum is, uh, was founded in 1886, but the actual museum building what came out of 1967. And it was many, a few years after 67, the process of actually creating the museum and uh, that we know today uh, was, was many years into the beginning of uh, the 1970s. And one of the most iconic dioramas of the museum is the mammoth. So this was a this is a picture of the mammoth being created. Uh, it's not a real mammoth. It's made out of foam um, and musk ox hair, not mammoth hair. Um, and some of those rocks that you see in the front are real and some are just um, just materials. But it looks really real um, and that's the magic of it. So the same thing on the third floor, this is uh, when the Century Hall, or not Century Hall, when Old Town was being created. 
Um, so this is early days of just creating the foundations of what uh, this might look familiar. You could see the sign that said Grand Hotel. So before it was the place that you sort of magically got swept back a hundred years, um, it was just wood <laughs> and people like nailing things up. And then this is um, the, the water wheel being constructed. So you see it, uh, the water wheel being constructed, it being put up, and then this is what it is today. And that water wheel's been uh, continuously going for 40 years. So, which is pretty impressive. And one of the things about dioramas that are really like the creativity about it is this, this um, not knowing where, like it's the trick of the eye. So there's the three dimensional space and then it goes into a two dimensional space of the backdrop with the, the painting. And this is the fur trading uh, diorama and it, you know, there's rocks and then it goes into the painting of mountains. And it's, uh, there's a real skill to, to, to that, that uh, those artists in the begin at the, at the beginning of the, of the museum were um, incredibly skilled at doing. There's also mini dioramas uh, all throughout the museum. This is the Skadans village uh, in the First Peoples Gallery. Um, Chris, I think your slides have frozen. Oh, really? Oh, no. Um, they have for Anya and I both. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure. But yeah, if, um, it's, you're describing them very well, though. Oh, <laughs> you, can, you can imagine them. OK. Well enough so, that I knew I wasn't looking at what you were describing. <laughs> no, no, no. no. It's, that's totally fine if it's, um, I'm having problems with my, with my uh, PowerPoint. I'll, I'll just, I'll let that go for now. So um, yeah, so there's the, the dioramas that go into um, the three-dimensional dioramas that go into the backdrop of the two-dimensional dioramas. Um, so one of the things that we, we, I like to do when I'm working with classes here is to um, both to have a critical eye on what, what are they seeing within the diorama. So um, what, do you what do you see right away? Um, what are you noticing? Uh, what more do you see? Um, and then as you, as you look at it, because there's so many layers of it, it's, look, um, Rebecca was talking about the creativity, creativity of every moment, and there's a creativity of looking as well. So if you're looking at one of the dioramas, I, I have spent lots of times with classes where it's like, let's look at this for 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, the amount of what they saw that after 10 minutes that they didn't see in the beginning is amazing. It's, a, um, it's a incredible, just like you give time to look, then you see more. So dioramas are really helpful that way. Um, and, and a creative act of looking. So one of the things that, um, so, so you can do that in many different, many different ways when you're at the museum, but also when you're at school um, in your classroom. And I wanted to just give um, a, little, a little look at what we, some of the things that we use here. So, Often when we think about dioramas, we, we think of shoe boxes. And that could be useful, and it's totally fine to use that. Um, and it creates a little bit of a, a frame, which can be helpful. But what I'd like you to sort of consider is to expand out the frame. So rather than just like, we're just looking at this frame of a shoe box, to really open it up. So this, these, this is just bent plastic. You could use this with cardboard and sort of create it, but open up the sides that you that that um, kids could look at it from different angles. Um, and then once you have that, then you could start to add some backdrops. And what's what's nice about dioramas, that same idea of creative looking is also creative sort of building too. So looking at a backdrop and saying to learn or asking your learners to think about what kind of animals would live in this, would, in this kind of environment. If you, were, if you were an animal, where would you want to go in this environment? 
how many animals do you think are actually in this environment? So you might think, oh yeah, there's like, maybe there's, there's a bear, there would be a bear, but there's also like thousands and thousands of insects all throughout here. Or, or what you could also ask what, what animals live here and what animals would pass by here. So you start to get a sense of um, this is a set place, but also this is a, a place where people are, or where animals are going by and going through, animals and plants. So, um, and then you're just with a background, you can change it up and say, okay, where are we, are, where are we at now? So adding the sort of layers of questions before we add anything and before we do anything with the actual, um, with the actual mural. I mean, with, that, with the actual um, diorama. And then, then you could start to, now that you have the background, just putting some green fabric all, all right away starts to make a um, forest floor. And because, especially with the changing of seasons, just getting things that you would collect in your, your um, schoolyard to add in um, and then even just like, like uh, the animals that you would have in the classroom anyway, or, or that you can just buy at any, at any store um, is really good. And then with, with having that um, accessible from all sides, then asking your learners to sort of come close to it, maybe go across the way to the, the other end of the classroom. How does it look different? What are you noticing differently? Um, so that you're thinking, of, always thinking of the diorama as a as an active as an active space. And one thing I also would encourage is that when it's not about sort of creating a diorama and then keeping it static, but maybe you're creating a diorama over a a, a week. And what is changing within that space? What animals enter into it? So it might be like a a, a unit that you would do over a whole week where animals are coming in and out. And maybe you're taking a photograph of that. And then another thing that we, we like to do here is then to, to animate that too. So just simple stop motion animation. So you're taking what looks like it's static and making it more, more dynamic. Um, so, uh, the, so, the, so what we would typically do when we're, when it's not, the pandemic and when classes could come into the museum is to do that work in the classroom then or come to the museum first to look at the diorama and get a sense of what are some of the strategies that those artists did go back to the classroom work on it and then come back to the museum with your dioramas and show that um, in a more public way uh, and um, so hopefully we'll be able to do that again but at the very least, like we, we would love to, to work with you and um, maybe there's other ways that we could share, share that to the larger museum um, public as well. Um, one thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna do is I'll add into the chat, both in Zoom and on Facebook Live, uh, a session of RBCM at Home Kids that we did was a workshop with our exhibit arts uh, technician, Megan Anderson all around creating dioramas. So you could look at that and she has some really good strategies on how to make dioramas from the, from the ground up. So I, I'll put that link uh, on the chat, in the chat and in the comments section as well. All right, so that's, that's a little window into like the creative use of dioramas um, and uh, what you could, could, how you can use it with your, with your learners. All right, well, thanks so much. And, um, and I'm sorry that my uh, PowerPoint was not working, but most of the, most of the uh, slides you saw. All right, so who is next? I am. All right. Take it away, Devin. All right, so um, like Caitlin said before, creativity can be really hard. Um, I know I'm definitely one of those people that she described that needs to bounce ideas off of people and uh, really talk things out. And that's just not something that we're as able to do now. 
Um, so we wanted to give you something really simple and kind of go back to basics. So we thought, what does the library do best? We bring the community together and we share stories. And whose story is better to share than your own? So that's why we decided to um, do a mini letter writing workshop with our time. Both Caitlin and I have um, worked on successful letter writing programs in libraries in Caitlin's previous position at another system. Um, she did a really great letters to Santa program that um, rolled into the Canada Post annual campaign that was really well received. And last year at the central branch of the Greater Victoria Public Library, we um, had bought this really great little Melissa and Doug um, mailbox toy. And so one of our librarians suggested that we put it out and we let kids write letters. And so they produced a prompt and printed out a bunch of pages that just said, I love my library because at the top. And then she put out those papers, anything that kids would want to write or draw with, um, envelopes and stickers for stamps because it's really giving that authentic feel of like sending the mail. So I think there's something special about that feeling of putting, putting the letter in the slot. Um, and we were really surprised. At, we thought it'd be just kind of a fun thing and it really took off. Uh, over two months, we were, uh, the library received 500 letters um, from little children and families all the way up to middle schoolers. Um, it was really a, a very cool experience, I think, for all of us. We shared some of the letters that were given to us on a board. We'd actually, part of the uh, prompt at the bottom of the page, there was a little box so that the children and families could check it if they cons consented to having their, their letter shared, which I thought was really nice. And we just received so many great um, letters about why people love the libraries, what they enjoyed. Um, some staff even got their own letters addressed to them. I know I kept mine. It's in my, my drawer for when I need a little happy time. Um, and after two months, we just thought we've got to send this on because it's something that we want to share with all of our other library colleagues. So we sent the uh, mailbox on to another branch and people were so sad when they came into Central and realized they couldn't send any more mail. Um, and we actually, I know we had a couple of families go and track down which library had the next mailbox. And I think that really shows um, that there's there's something about that that connection and that um, that way of I think storytelling and um, just the whole process of sending mail. So screen time for everybody is just huge right now. Um, and things that we used to do in person, we have to go virtual from classes and clubs to even this professional development experience that we're doing right now. Um, digitally is how we do the bulk of our communications and communicating virtually has been so helpful and a real lifeline um, in the, the pandemic experience, um, but it really lacks the warmth and doesn't provide the connection that we get from an in-person communication. Um, so even though we are still able to really um, connect and communicate with our loved ones, um, social isolation is still something that I think we all suffer from to a certain extent. Um, and it's something that we've been talking about at the library, ways we can alleviate that for our patrons. And I think that a letter writing program would be really great to alleviate that for your students as well. Because I think letter writing really adds some of that warmth back in. Um, when someone writes you a letter, you know they've really thought about you. They have taken the time to sit down to like compose that letter. It's not like an email that you're going to whip off um, after 30 seconds of thought. It's something that you really like actually have to actively do. Um, and I think that that's part of why it adds that connection. Um, also, it just feels really nice to get mail. 
I, you know, I know online shopping has skyrocketed and I think it's because everyone wants to get a little mail. So it would be nice to get an actual letter. Um, now, before writing a letter, you need to choose who you're going to write to. Um, so we've come up with some examples, um, but then we would like to open it up after I've got my list down um, to see if anyone else has some ideas of who your students could write to. So one thing about letter writing is it doesn't have to be to another person. Um, letters to yourself are great. They're a great journaling exercise. You can write to your future or your past self. Um, I think writing a letter, um, letting your past self know uh, what you're going through now might be a really cathartic and a really great um, exercise. But I also think that writing to your future self and having, you know, keeping these letters for the kids to open at the end of the year to really see what they, um, you know, how they've progressed and what their kind of hopes and dreams were um, at the start of the year. Um, I think that's another really great exercise to do. Or you could even have it so that they're opening this letter many years in the future, which I think is also fun. Uh, getting them to write to a classmate. I think especially um, it's a different way of getting to know someone. And with some um, classes being online and some being in person, I think that we're not really getting to know our classmates and our teachers the way that we normally do, right? So I think that that would be a really great way to have like an in-class pen pal that you really got to know on a deeper level. Um, you could also have it be between classes or bet even someone at another school, I think would be really fantastic um, and really getting that experience with other, what other kids are going through. Um, and another great idea I think is partnering with a senior's facility. Um, and having a senior and student uh, pen pal program. Um, I know that a lot of the seniors facilities are um, still fairly like closed off. So this would really help with that, um, help with the social isolation. And it would also create some really great cross-generational connections. Um, does anyone else have any ideas of who kids could write to? Feel free to put it in the chat or Facebook Live. Oh, pets. I love that. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, I think that would be a really fun exercise of what would you actually tell your pet if it could understand your letter. I think that's really lovely. Um, I also love the idea because pets don't have Pets never judge. You can really um, let things out to a pet that you can't maybe to another person. So I think that's really fantastic. Another option I think would be really great is having them write to the characters in the books they're reading. So there's lots of people that your students can write to, whether you're, they're actually sending out the mail or not. I was thinking also, Devin, the, um, there's often in schools like Big Buddy, um, oh yeah, big little. Yeah, big little buddies. So like maybe there's there's a way in which there could be a writing component to that because usually it's just coming into the classroom and reading, but maybe there could be a writing uh, like letter component to that and and have educators sort of have kids register. Like what does that feel? How does that feel to get a letter um, from someone that you know in the school? I think that'd be really fantastic. Also, I have to ask Chris, I have a friend in the States who works in a library, or sorry, a museum, and they have a giant dinosaur out front, and they've had letters written to the dinosaur. So I was wondering, have you ever had letters to the woolly mammoth? Well, it was the 40th birthday of the woolly mammoth this year. So we had a birthday party in January, a big birthday party, and we had a huge mammoth birthday card. So everyone that came, and there were like hundreds of people writing letters to the woolly mammoth wishing it a happy birthday and um, and some really, really sweet uh, sentiments. So, but that's awesome. a really great idea. Just like, yeah, to, to write letters to the actual animals that are in the, 
in the dioramas. I like it. I might <laughs> take that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so now that you've kind of maybe decided who you're writing to, you actually have to start the letter. And starting letters can be really difficult. Again, with that. Oh, sorry, um, sorry, Devin. Just to, oh. um, we had Floyd from oh. Facebook Live who said yes. um, Santa or elves in terms oh, of. Oh, yeah, writing. that's totally great. Yeah. I think that that's a really fun program, especially because the kids are guaranteed a letter back. Um, and I think that that's, I think them getting a letter back if they are sending something off is so um, important for the process. Because like you said, that feeling, what does it feel like to get that, that letter and to like learn about someone in that way? Um, so yeah, getting started on a letter can be the most difficult part of the letter. Um, so we recommend using prompts for your students, like our I Love the Library Because prompts. So I have some letter writing ideas, and then I'll open it up again. So um, I think one of the things that a lot of people think of when they are, they're writing letters is that they're they're writing true things. They're writing factual things about themselves or about what's going on. Um, but stories don't have to be truthful. Um, I think a really great way to do a um, letter writing program would be a round robin story where each of the partners was writing, you know, a line or a paragraph and they could continue to kind of create that story together. Um, also, one of my favorite things with our um, I Love the Library program or, um, campaign was that uh, we got a lot of really great um, drawings and comics. So it also doesn't have to be a lot of writing as well. It can be, um, it can take a lot of really different forms, the letter. But for um, writing an actual letter, I totally recommend um, using things that are a little, um, that are gonna create a real connection. So everyone has a favorite food. So why not get the students, your students, sorry, to describe their favorite food or their favorite snack and even share the recipe and ask for that back. So they can kind of create their own little cookbook out of it. Um, another thing that really connects people, I think, is asking them to describe their funniest or craziest moment in their lives. Like, I think that's something that people get really excited to, to read about and to share. Um, and another thing that a teacher friend of mine did uh, this past semester that I really loved, she taught grade sixes and she got them to make a, like a mixtape of their five favorite songs or five songs that represented them and um, write it in a kind of a letter to her so that she was able to get to know and I thought that was a really fantastic thing to do because I, I also think that music really unites us. Um, so there's lots of different things you can do. Oh, and Rebecca's got, in my high school years, a good friend and I created a comic strip. I love that. We'd finish it in a day. And so I love that. I love the idea of saving. I'm a big letter and card saver. So the idea of saving these types of things is really fantastic. And I think it's really yeah. something lovely to look back on. And also just, um, especially for people on Facebook Live that can't read that Sorry. comment on um, in Zoom, but also Rebecca, you were saying that it helped you process the day. Um, it really was a window into whatever our issues were, right? The person who drew the first panel, it could be the way someone looked at you in the hallway, right? Uh, whatever the drama was in the high school at that moment or the cafeteria seating. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we would each draw a panel and just pass it back and forth in between classes, usually finishing it in a day. We'd pass it around for our friends to see it because it was really the story of our lives, but through a turtle and a crumpled piece of paper that we called Hermione. It was Herman the turtle and Hermione the piece of paper. Um, and they're really, I think I have like a hundred, over a hundred of them. They're and I have them in a binder here. They're just, they're so a, a window into that time. And it was meaningful for us all to share it. And it was a great way to look at the drama of your life in a way that you could laugh at it and make a little bit of space when things are hard. Oh, yeah. We also have another comment from, oh, from 
our friends at the Maritime Museum. Um, I always Anya. draw a fun, sorry? That would be Anya, she's behind Anya. the Anya. All right, I always draw a fun cartoon on the envelope around the address. And I love that. I think that kids love putting those um, stickers as stamps on. And we've got a lot of extremely creative envelopes as well. So I think having that, the whole package as something um, is a really nice way to go. So. And then Devin, um, I just add in uh, Chris on Facebook Live writes, uh, you've opened up a whole new world of writing for me. Thank you very much. Love that it can be short or creative, easy, no pressure in this COVID time to have a tool is great. So. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, oh, and Laura on um, our Zoom webinar says, to this day, I have a pen pal in Germany and I'm always very excited to see her letters. They've never met, but they've been writing for over a decade now. And that's another thing, you could do a full on international pen pal um, program. And I think that would be really fun for the kids, especially today. Um, so yeah, there's just a lot of different ways that I think you can use letter writing in the classroom and even maybe outside the classroom in our own lives, we should all write a few more letters. Um, to wrap up, I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that the library, and if you're participating outside of Victoria, your local library, has some really great materials from books about letter writing to uh, epistolary stories for both younger and older kids and adults. Um, and you could also share them with as part of this exercise as well, and maybe even get them to write a letter to us if you so wished. So, thank you. That's really awesome. We, we do a letter writing week, uh, the first week in January here at the museum. And even just uh, sometimes kids, it's like, oh, a pen and paper. <laughs> sometimes we like forget that, oh yeah, that actually sometimes still happens. And, and it, like, so it, yeah, it's like we have some, sometimes have assumptions of um, ways of communicating that it's nice letter writing can just kind of um, cut those assumptions. So thank you so much, Devin. Thank you. And now I think uh, Laura and Anya are next. Yes, we're next up. Yeah, thank you so much, Devin. That was amazing. Um, so yeah, we're, we're going to, I'll start here with you, but then um, we're going to actually switch over to Anya's camera because we're um, actually doing a hands-on activity. So um, when Anya and I were kind of thinking of just like making activities, we kept coming back to knots. I don't know why, but it's probably because there's a giant board full of different examples of knots in the Maritime Museum. And it's like a really important thing for maritime skills, maritime knowledge, just to be able to tie a good knot can be the difference between life and death. Um, but then doing a little bit more research into it, like it's not just maritimes, like knots are all around us. They are literally everywhere in our lives. Like the knots you tie on your shoes are one of the first knots you learn to do on your own. Even um, your clothing, like this is just a series of knots. Everything that we're, like what we're wearing is knots. What you use to tie up your pajama pants is knots. Even um, our technology is the knotting of different types of wires and um, the cables that we use to build massive buildings and bridges. Those are knots. <laughs> so knots are really important and they're like, a cross-cultural thing. They exist in all cultures at all, pretty much all times throughout history. There are like different versions of the same type of knot even throughout histories that were developed independently of one another. So it's really like this super rich history and also an art form. Like you don't think of knotting as an art, but when you see what some people are able to do and even just the small things you can do yourself, it is art. Like Rebecca was saying, um, creativity is everywhere and knots are art. Um, so we thought we would kind of think a little bit outside the box in terms of what you can do with your art skills and your students 
and use knots for art. Um, they aren't messy. It's really easy to undo them and start over again. Um, I'm a teacher by training, so I've definitely been in that art class with that one student who just wants to start a new paper 10 to 15 times. <laughs> and as you hand them the paper, you're like, this is the last one, right? <laughs> But with a knot, you can just undo it and you can start it over again. And as they practice, it's something um, that can also just be like something to keep those busy hands busy while thinking about other things because knot tying is, it can be mindless once you get good enough at it. So um, we're going to switch over to Anya's screen now. So you'll see kind of some stuff that's on the table that we're working with here. And we're gonna do a couple um, knot tying things, just that you can practice with. You can practice with us now, um, or you can practice them at with any other time too in your classroom. There's like a lot of resources for this online, but um, we're gonna get started. Sorry, wrong one. Turn off my video, not my audio. So the first one that you can do is actually teach kids how to tie their laces a little bit differently. So this one is just is actually quite simple. All we've done is just laced them up a little bit differently. And this is any kid who's learning how to tie their shoes might get a kick out of like, oh, I get to do my shoes differently than other kids. Um, but yeah, so this is my regular shoes. All you have to do is unlace them to get started. And as I unlace them, I'm going to let Anya tell you a little bit about um, just like knot tying in different cultures. So if you are talking about to knitting or tatting, making lace or uh, crochet, you know that you can make very decorative pieces out of knots and ties. Um, so sailors realized this because they had some uh, time to kind of uh, unwind on long, long voyages. So they developed kind of a cottage industry. They'd make pieces that uh, they could use. So they could put it around maybe the handle of a knife to make it more comfortable, to make hammocks that they could sleep in. Um, but they started making them very decorative um, using different uh, hitches and knots. And so these could be sold when they finally got to port, they could make a little bit of money. Um, so the word macrame, um, which is the, the art form that we're doing today, um, it's very, very old, like parts of it are very old, the knots used. Um, the word macrame, it could come from Arabic or Turkish, um, mikramak or uh, macrama, uh, and those were used for, to describe decorative uh, fringing on uh, towels or bedspreads or other, a, uh, or other uh, textiles, household textiles. Um, so these, uh, these decorative pieces were spread around the world through trade and conquest. People moved around, goods moved around, crafts moved around. And by the 17th century, macrame or like the, the, the nodding decorative pieces was extremely popular in Europe. Um, it was actually taught by uh, by the queen uh, during the 17th century in the English court. Uh, she taught her ladies in waiting how to do this fanciful uh, rope lace. Um, in Victorian era, it was extremely popular um, as sailors traveled around the world. They would trade their pieces in China, in the Americas, anywhere they went um, by sea. And so uh, it was extremely popular. People had them in their houses as, uh, as wall hangings or uh, ergonomic pieces like hammocks and things like that. All right, All so, right. so um, uh, what I have done here on the lace is I just laced the second hole down on underneath. And then all I'm doing is just spiraling loops in and out of the holes. And that's all you need to do to get it started. This is actually quite easy to do. So once you teach someone how to do this, you might notice it on everyone's shoes. Um, and I timed myself how long it took me, to, me myself alone to do it. And it was three minutes. So to teach kids, it might take a whole class, but it's a cool way of just showing them that there are other ways of having art in your life. You can have some pretty artistic shoelaces if you lace them up. 
So once you get all of the loops down, you need to bring them back up through all those loops you made to the top. So I'm gonna do it on the other side as well. And then, oh, got it. And then you cross it into the top hole that you left empty. And, oh, is my hole lined up? Yeah, it's okay. And then you tighten it and you should have your laces. It might take a little bit of adjustment to get it all the loops where you need them to be, but there is more or less your fancy knot tied laces. So anyone who has laces on their shoes can do this. And um, it's just a fun way of keeping one's hands busy too, which is, I guess, part of those long sea voyages. Um, so we have a number of these kinds of knots. So this is a um, sailor's knot is kind of the generic term for it. And it's one continuous piece of string or rope to make these typically. Now the bracelet we are going to make today, it lies like this and goes around your arm like so. It's actually quite nice. Um, this is actually, it's very easy to make as well. Um, definitely a little bit, um, it, looks, it looks more complex than it actually is. Um, but here we go. So what you need is two pieces, oh, I'll move my mouse out of the way. <laughs> You'll need two pieces of string or rope that are about two feet long. Um, I measured on the ruler, so yeah, 30 cent or 60 centimeters altogether. And each of those pieces can be the same color, they can be different colors, whatever you want for this one. I'm using this cotton macrame cording. Um, and macrame cording is pretty easy to find. We got ours from Michael's. Um, but you can use shoelaces for it, you can use paracord. Um, apparently my computer wants to update right now. <laughs> Bad timing. Um, so yeah, so what we do to make this one here is first you need to start with your loop and you twist it, these two ends at the end up here. So this is the, the start of our loop. So that's there, ready to go. Now I take my other cord, which I have also folded in half, and I am working with the loop at the top here to lace it around. So I want to bring it, um, sorry, I'm just looking at my, my model here because we all need that. So what you need to do is put this bit on top of that loop. So easy first step, I'm laying it like this. And now you're doing kind of just an over under type of thing. So it's over right now. So the next step is to bring it under this other loop here. I'm bringing it over the double end here, under this, the two white cords that are here, over the black cord, sorry, my hands are covering it. So I went under the white and now I'm coming over the black up here. And then I have to go under the white again. And it's like an under over thing is how you do it. And then I grab both ends and I pull. And then I end up with my sailor's knot. Um, and knots have represented a ton of things throughout time, like even you call getting married tying a knot, which quite literally you do when you get married in some cultures, you tie a knot together, there's rituals surrounding it. Um, in Chinese culture, these knots have told stories, they've been used for discounting or for um, counting and record keeping and all of those kinds of amazing things. So this is, this one's quite easy, but a lot of these knots are continuous and repetitive and there's something that can be really good for um, keeping busy hands busy and crafting like this is really good for mental health as well. It's something that you can go back to that's just a single minded focus um, to do the ends. You just double knot a couple times and then it'll make you two little knots at the end, like these ones. Like the original fidget spinner, right? Exactly, where's the camera on this one? There we go. So yeah, it's just a double knot at the end. 
<laughs> so yeah, just like the original fidget spinner. So the, those are, sorry, I keep turning off my microphone instead of my camera. So Laura, those, I, I oh. was just thinking also that um, having the, having it be two different colors, it seemed like that was helpful when you were doing it to say like, okay, the black under the, the white, maybe if for, for if it's a class, like it would be helpful to have those two different colors just to set them up for success, is that? Absolutely, yeah. It's good to have two different colors. Um, and also like then they can be a little bit more um, individualized in that way too, if you have multiple colors. Um, like the red and white that we used for ours, um, this is just paracord and it's available quite cheaply at Michael's. Like it's not a very expensive, um, piece of material and even like old shoelaces if you wanted to do that would work for this um, you can make smaller versions of this using smaller string like depending on how thick your rope is that's how thick the item will become uh, i did see a comment here from ann that she teaches kids at school the turquoise turtle knot for tying their shoelaces so yeah, exactly. Like it's a it's a life skill learning to tie a bow, and you don't really think about it as just like part of a family of thousands of other knots. Um, they were actually currency for a while in among sailors. Like you would trade a knot that you knew for a knot that someone else knew. <laughs> so you could always set kids to teach each other how to tie a new knot. Um, so they were trading the experience of how to do it? Like they would teach it? Yeah, exactly. Like oh, you wear a knot. Um, oh, the turquoise turtle is a secure knot, also known as the shoemaker's knot. Okay, good to know. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's called like a double hitch reef knot or something is what a bow tie or a little, like what you tie your shoes with. <laughs> so it has a very fancy name. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of think, or let you think outside the box in terms of what you can do because it's like the cleanup for knot tying, there's hardly any. You don't need a sink in your classroom to do knot tying and you don't need to worry about um, kids congregating in one air big area all together when they're cleaning their paintbrushes and stuff. So you can easily have these things cut and prepared in advance. Use your um, document projector to show your hands while you're you're doing their knot and let them let them be creative with it. A lot of kids I notice if you show them pictures of it even on a piece of paper they'll just work ahead. Yeah. They figure it out. <laughs> yeah so I think um, that brings us to the end of our time together and um, do any of the panelists have anything else that they want to share about um, what we've talked about so far today before we end off? I was just thinking that all four have a certain way in which both creativity and also like calming presence and especially during this time like we talk about the pandemic period but it's also like self-care is really really important so um so just thinking like fusing that idea of creativity and self-care um it could be really could be useful tying about um what rebecca said at the beginning about making space for boredom and um once you sort of know what you're doing with the knot tying i know i've done macrame projects in the past and i found that really helpful for my creative process, as I talked about at the beginning, I need to take a step away and um, give my brain some space to process. Um, but I want my hands to be fidgety, just like students want their hands to be fidgety, right? We're all people. And so um, I think they all sort of tie really beautifully together. And, and if you're tying some knots and being in your body, then that's going to give you space to think about what letter you want to write or how you want to build your diorama or, or what you need to sort of add into those things. And so I think they, they all sort of came together really beautifully. I really love how, uh, how creative all of you are and how um, amazing it is to actually be together, even in a virtual room. And uh, it's really inspiring 
to have other people's sort of insights and views and things. And I'm going to take away lots because there's stuff that's not really just for kids. That's what I'm taking away. It's like, um, I'm fascinated by all these things, right? How we look at dioramas, how long we look at something, that creative looking is such a powerful idea. And I too have crocheted and I do actually buy nice cards in my letters now. So these are all, um, they are all good self-care things right now, which uh, it's cross-generational, which I, I kind of love the sort of insight that, yeah, that that's the same for all of us across the years. So I'm really grateful to all of you for what you brought today. I really enjoyed it as well as all those who've joined us and shared their thoughts and observations. It's really kind of lovely. It's been a nice day. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I, so I, I left teaching a few years back, but I mean, seeing all these activities, I'm like, oh, I want to try these in a classroom. <laughs> I'm just like thinking of dioramas that I can make and, oh, when can I sing again? Um, and going to be continuing to write letters all the time. So especially now, even just writing letters to family members that are far away from us right now and we don't get to see as much. And um, that would be really good to to do too. Um, maybe, maybe that's a good segue, Laura, to put the slide back up with our contact information in terms of writing us letters and connecting with us, educators out there, both again, also like informal and formal educators, whether you're um, you have a classroom, or you're an EA, or you're, you're an educator within the community, or whether you're a parent um, that need, that would, like to connect with us and find ways to work together. Yeah, I'm sorry, one sec. I just put no, it in okay. chat as well so people can copy paste it if they want to instead of um, trying to get it all here. So here is the slide um, with all of our names, Rebecca with the opera, Chris at the Royal BC Museum, Devin and Caitlin with the Greater Victoria Public Library and myself and Anya with Maritime Museum of BC. We hope to hear from some of you about creative ideas that you have going on that you'd like help with. We definitely, we're, we're not in as many classrooms as we were able to in 2019, 2020. So, so it'd be really good to even virtually get into some of them this year. I and put that in the comment section on Facebook Live too. So. Oh, thank you. Great. So yes, thank you all so much. And um, hopefully we'll hear from some of you in the coming weeks. And um, if it's sunny where you are, I hope you enjoy the sun. And if it's rainy where you are, I hope you enjoy the rain and have a wonderful weekend. All right, thanks everyone.